Thank you for coming this evening. Uh, I just, uh, we've had a great time over there, so I really appreciate you uh, waiting while we prepared this. Um, first of all, I just would like to thank, you know, the people that helped, Pat Vine, you know, and the Mesa College uh, Gallery uh, staff for the work that they did, and uh, Cindy Zimmerman also for the support that the Museum Studies class gave in both installing and the reception. Um, it was fantastic. They did a great job. Uh, my name is Barbara Sexton. I was the curator of uh, Undern Intimacies and uh, enjoyed putting the show together. And we'll now hear briefly from the two artists. And what I'd like to do as the moderator is, you know, have each of them start out with their remarks. And then at the end, we'll hold questions. And then at the end, they'll both come up and you can ask them questions just so that we give each an opportunity to, you know, give their remarks and talk about their work. So let's start off with Michelle Iverson. And we'll have to it. All right, well, since, hello, my name is Michelle Iverson, and I, as you know, I'm part of this show, and I would like to tonight talk to you a little bit about this, the Night Surveillance series. <coughs> Originally, the Night Surveillance series started out as a book. Um, the Night Surveillance series was part of this, um, it came from the book Quick and Dirty. And Quick and Dirty was, uh, it was actually a, all the images were four by six, and they were four by six black and white images, and I printed them on acetate. And, they, and I made them into a book, and the book was of a, um, an accordion design. So you could actually see through the book. You you could have, it would you could make it one one inch, or I mean you could make it one foot or five feet, and the front and the back cover had a hole cut in it, so that you could actually see each of the images from from start to finish, from end to from one end to the other, and you could see through each image of um, of these surveillance photographs. And it, um, I also was a um, I was very interested in um, in being uh, the fact of being a private detective. I was interested in the idea of what do private detectives do, and what is it that they, how do they get into our private lives? And I was inspired by um, write different writers and different prose and different things about private detectives. And this is why I started this to begin with. So I went. I thought one night I would start, uh, get in my car, I took my Nikon camera, I took a 180 lens, and I got into the car, and I put my tripod up on, a, uh, on the seat, I strapped it in with two bungee cords and a seat belt, and I went around and started scanning into the neighborhoods. I scanned into everywhere I could. And I tried to find different different places in which I wanted uh, different images that I thought were interesting, and uh, I had to do a lot of waiting and watching. And one of the uh, at this particular image, I was uh, I waited and I watched until he fell asleep. <laughs> so you never know exactly what 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 is going to happen, and I also was very interested in the lighting and I was interested in exactly the frame in which the frame that was within my frame the window panes became frames I used a 180 lens to somewhat flatten the image 
but and I used the and I tried to look at the lighting inside of each of these homes and inside each of the windows. I had to sit and really take that as a consideration. What was what exactly was going on lighting wise? Um, but I was very interested in what was going on with each person as I stood and waited in on the street. Now, I never get out of my car. I never approach uh, people's homes. I stay in the car and I have my, car, my, my camera in the car. But that doesn't mean that people don't see you. So I, uh, so I lay there waiting. It's, I feel like sometimes it's like I, they're almost in a trap. And I wait for them to, I wait for them to do something or I wait for something to happen. And I'm not looking for anything in particular. Like it, as a private investigator, they have an agenda. They're looking for something. What I'm looking for is what you're willing to show me. What is what I'm willing to um, see? What what I'm willing to watch? Um, sometimes I would encounter animals. Um, here, as you'll see, there was an animal in in the the image. But you also see the lighting outside of the uh, outside of the home which I think paid, this animal was definitely outside. And you'll see the lighting that um, separates him and the, and the, uh, and the window. Oops. Here, I, uh, this is double rectangles, so I, I, I kind of call this. And, and you see that you're actually looking into this home, and these people are eating. But you actually get to see the front of their faces because of the double image, which was just surprising to me because I really got to see almost what they were eating. He's eating soup, I think. And, um, and so when I'm lying there too, sometimes I'm lying down, sometimes I'm sitting, I have a shutter release so that I, I, I set up the camera and I look through the viewfinder. But by the time someone's walked through the frame, sometimes I might have to change that a little bit so it's difficult to get exactly what I want to get. Um, so I have to sometimes change it, change the, the viewfinder or whatever, but what I try to do is pretend that the camera, I set it up, I, I stand there and wait to see what I want, what, what is there, what, is, what has come to me, and then I shoot without looking, so that no one is watching me actually shoot it. I'm looking this way, I'm hitting my shutter release over here, and my camera is pointed towards the, um, uh, towards whomever. Okay. This one was taken in Santa Ana, California, and right near the racetrack, which I thought was kind of interesting because here there's an image on in in this um, dining room or living room, and this the light really beautifully glistened right onto what she was reading, and then onto these images on the wall. I watched her; she paced back and forth for a very long time. She was pacing and walking with whatever she was reading. Whoops. Okay. I sat and I sat and I watched and I waited for something to come on that TV. There was nothing in the shelves and there was nothing on the television. And, and there was a cat sitting there. So I just sometimes would wait for something to happen, but just the actual being there was what was happening. So, so it takes a little bit of, of, of watching and not expecting what you, you might expect something, but you, it might be right in front of you what, you're, what you really want. I use the frame a lot. I think the frame of the uh, windows always cut up the image into a very interesting way. And again, the lighting, it's just, it's just interesting how each room, room is lit. In this particular image, um, she saw me. And so I call this, she sees me, and I took off so fast. <laughs> Because in fact, she, you know, I was watching her. I was watching. Her, I wasn't getting anything. I was, but, but, for, but I thought the window frame was interesting. I thought the lighting. I thought where, what I was looking. This is where I wanted. I, 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 I wouldn't leave. And she never gave me anything until she looked at me. And that's when she gave. That, that's when I got the image. And I really remember taking off. 
<laughs> this image I call, these are my soft titles. I call this image, um, woman licking plate. <laughs> and I will say that I had a difficult time taking this image. I felt bad. I felt, I watched her. She walked up to the, she was, I was watching her for a long time. And a long time could be one minute, a long time could be 20 minutes. It depends on how many people are walking by, how many people are leaving their houses, what, what's going on. Sometimes I can't stay in a place, whoops, very long. And, uh, and I remember watching her for a long while. And finally she walked over t to the window as close as she could get. She had a plate in her hand, and she began to lick it, and lick it, and lick it, and lick it. And I thought to myself, I, I, I didn't even hit the shutter. I was like, oh my God. You know, I, I really felt like, I, I felt that it was such an intimate moment. I felt it was so intimate that I couldn't even, that I, I really couldn't do what I got there to do. And then I figured it out, I sh hit the shutter, and I left. But um, it, it really, she was like an actor for me. In this image, I think that we are watching her use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I'm not sure, but I have a really good feeling about it because I watched her for a while and walk in. It wasn't too, didn't take too long to get it's in her seat and um, and I um, and I had to shoot it and I felt I felt like um, she didn't she wouldn't mind <laughs> <laughs> this is I love this because this man is wearing mismatched pajamas and he's vacuuming and it must be 12 or 1 o'clock in the afternoon could be my husband. No, he vacuums late. People who vacuum late, I don't know. But I just love the way that the light was in these windows and how on the right side of the image you can see uh, it's like almost frosted and on the right side, and uh, well on my right side, and yeah, and you, on the right side and on the left side it's very clear. Um, now you'll also notice that these images are somewhat blurry. I push the film, I make it so that they look somewhat less, um, they're, they're more grainy than, because it's more, it leans itself to, to, to surveillance. So, like in this image, I use the moonlight also. Sometimes there's moonlight, and, and, and this could be moonlight, this could be a, uh, a spot. I don't exactly remember, but on the outside, you see the outside edge of this image. And you, I th they were having a candlelight dinner see the candle lights and um, and just the textures in this image and the and the uh, whoops the uh, the way that you see it dark on the right side and, and on the left side and lighter on the right side it's because there's obviously another room in the back uh, there's a doorway there and so the lighting again becomes very important to me I'm watching what's going on inside with the lighting so that when the image comes out, I think that they become, they're, they're quite beautiful. I'm looking at how it will look with the way it's lit at, in the evening and what will happen. And sometimes I'm dealing with silhouettes and I, there's very few that I take with silhouettes because I'm looking more sometimes for identity. I'd rather see a little bit more of the people, but then there's other times when I just really think it's a, it's an interesting enough image to take it. And again, the lighting here, I think, is, is beautiful. This guy is talking to his lover. It's just kind of my soft. And again, these crosses, which cross, you know, it's kind of like stopping. You're not supposed to be looking. These bars are supposed to stop us from looking, but I think they, they really intrigue me the different um, shapes of the windows and the, uh, uh, the shades, such as this. Here you see a balance of light, I think, that really works for, with this image, and then you see some information about this person on his wall.
Here I think they were doing the dishes or changing the baby's diaper. I'm not exactly sure, but I shot quite a, a few of these and the light kept reflecting around on different places in, in that image and I got it so that it actually reflected onto her face and so I could see more of whom it, who it was. So, but they didn't look like they, they looked like they were interacting but they didn't look like they were interacting at all. You know, they seemed to be doing something but yet they weren't real connected. Very difficult for me to get more than a few people in, 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 a, uh, in a window. And this I thought was delicate and yet there was a lot of, um, I liked the way the way frames were cut up with the windows, the vertical lines. I, I mean the, the horizontal line and the big vertical in the middle. And these people were talking for a long time. I waited to see if they were going to, what they might do. But they just were talking and talking. They moved around a little bit and then sat back down and I just waited. And I just thought this was just what, this was good enough. Again, the bar across her face. Again, I, I push the film. I try, I, I like to make it more grainy sometimes depending on the image. So this works for, for me using the grain and, and making it more surveillance looking. Okay, this is in Sierra Madre and I watched these two people for a while and she is popping his pimples on his back. And it's hard to see, but it was, it's true. And I watched for a while because I couldn't figure out what was she doing, what was she doing. And he kept moving a little bit and then she would um, move a little bit and, and then I saw his back and the minute I saw his back I went just to make sure they were in my viewfinder and he had moved forward a little bit but this is what they were doing right by the window. <laughs> I don't know I would do that in the bathroom I think or without ne not next to a window. Oh this is a neighbor um, who is uh, shoving potato chips in her mouth. And this was a friend, this is at the corner of my, uh, my old street in Pasadena, and our friends used to live there, and they moved away, and so I was peeking in on my way home from shooting one night, just to kind of see who they were or what was going on, and since now I've taken this license that I think I can look into everybody's window, it's kind of like a I don't feel bad about that anymore. And that was one thing that I, uh, you know, I usually would not normally do. But um, I looked in, and she had a bag of potato chips. And I don't know, have you ever been eating without, unconsciously? I'm sure we all have. She was stuffing these potato chips in her mouth. I saw her go through half of a bag of potato chips. And uh, I had to take the photograph, and I never met her. We moved away, and I, I didn't know she, really who she was. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that prior, and this was in my notes that I forgot earlier, that, you know, prior to this, I am a very private person, and I respect people's boundaries. I respect people's personal space. I am the first, I'm not a looky-loo type of a, uh, of a personality. I have never, I would never go into anybody's private space, into your journal. I am not that person. So this was a very difficult thing for me to sit and do. I would feel, I felt like I was in many times violating people, but now I feel much better about it. <laughs> I, I, now I don't feel so, I, you know, I can do this, but it stays with me. It almost stays, it, it kind of, it stays with me each and every image. And when I saw the PR, uh, the press release, I don't know if any of you saw them, but they did the the press release was a, the licking plate. And I remember I had a real sinking feeling when I saw that. I felt like, oh my God, I, I was reliving that moment that was so difficult to watch. So each one of these images stay with me. And this one too, I mean, 
I know, when, you know, if I am starting, I'm like started a, a bag of crackers and like I'm not, and I'm going to finish them and I'm not even thinking about it, all of a sudden I'll think about this image about how I just, you don't even think about it, you're nervous or whatever it is and you just, you just binge or whatever, and, and not binge, but just you, you just eat unconsciously and that's what she was doing. This is Radio Man. He really didn't do much except play with that radio. He was playing with the radio, you know, but he wasn't, his eyes were open. He was just playing with a radio. And I just loved the way that the, that the um, blinds cut the image and cut into his head and his face. Whoops. This one is in Fullerton. And there were four people in this room. Um, and I watched for a while, but I, I just really was interested in how the lighting was, on, the balance of the light on the right and the left, and how the left had the, went into different rooms and the lighting came, came through in, in just little, in little spaces, but it brought it to the foreground. Whoops. And it, it was just, it, actually I drive by this a lot. I look at this window a lot, and I've taken some more images of it, but I haven't really made them uh, large. They're still in the can. but. It's an interesting window to, to watch. And I don't always see, I, I just never know what I'm going to see. So I just shoot randomly. Um, I just shoot what I think looks interesting to me. It's not always something that people are doing. I love the bamboo here the lighting of the bamboo, the light in between the bamboo shade, and then the stucco on the side of the house, the lighting on the outside of the house, and then this dog that was watching me. He never barked. He never did anything, but he kept, I could see his head move, and he kept watching me. And the guy in the closet, I was watching the guy in the closet, and he kept going in and out of the closet. And uh, I just thought it was an interesting silhouette of a dog and a man. And here's another one in National City. I really, this, I love the delicateness of this image and how you, you can see the statue of David magnet on the, on the refrigerator and how, again, it's, it's framed. By the structure of the, of the, um, of the window and also the curtains and the curtain rod and the beautiful lighting right in the center of the image. She's watering at night. I'm not exactly sure what he's doing. I call this fan man. But he's doing something down there. And he was doing it for a while. <laughs> I really don't know what it was. And I just thought the tree, it looked like the, you know, the tree could be inside or outside of the house. Whoops. And the fan on the left is just this beautiful shape. So that's just a glimpse of the of the images. I just I, what I did was once I started to actually go and take these images, I forgot the book and I, I, I didn't want them small. I needed them big. They needed to be large and as large as the uh, almost as large as the windows. And that's why I I, I switched and started making the series big. Um, and I really feel that if um, if I could stop doing this, I would, but I can't. This has been going on for a long time. I started this in 1995, which was pre, um, uh, it was before 9-11. It was before people had cam cameras in their phones. It was before we had cameras in our, sh in, our shopping, in our shopping centers. It was before we had 
surveillance cameras. I was doing this, I mean, not, not that they, they were probably in jewelry stores, but they certainly weren't in, at street corners, and they weren't in, in the places that they are. And I think I'm looking at not only as a voyeur, but I'm also looking at as people as exhibitionists. Why are people showing us all these things? Why is it when you walk down the street? Why is it that I see what I see? It's because people sit in front of the windows and they do it. It's not only because I stand there and I'm looking. If I was looking and your drapes were closed, I'd have nothing to shoot. So I think as a culture, we all are, have somewhat uh, either an exhibition element in our character or a voyeuristic one. And which is yours? I don't know. But that's it. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Sorry, it's not what it was supposed to be. So, and now David Phobes. I brought a fan club. Okay. <laughs> so my students call me Mr. Phobes or Mr. Phobes. Um, so I've taken on that <clears throat> name and uh, I've some, signed some of my work like that. Um, there was a point in teaching when they stopped calling me David and, stopped, and started calling me Mr. Phobes. And I realized, wow, I'm getting old. <laughs> <clears throat> this is a great uh, uh, quote. I love this. Um, the purpose of art is to reveal the questions that have been hidden by the answers. And uh, I, I've read that many years ago, and I, and I think about that a lot in the work. Um, when Barbara asked me to be in this show, I was like, why? Um, and some, a man came up to me today and says, what does your work have to do with unearned intimacies? Um, and I think that there's many ways that we can, we can talk about intimacies. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a few intimate moments of my life. Um, none of us uh, started out working, uh, you know, in this body of work. Uh, something that's very important about uh, my life is I have a twin brother. And that is something that you'll see. I'm not going to tell you what are twin works, but as you're looking at work, see if you can identify which works are twin works. Um, I was giving a presentation on my work about 15 years ago, and I was looking at the body of work, and it just dawned on me. I said, oh my God, I'm making twins, and you'll, you'll see why. This is something, you know, thinking about generations, I just thought I'd throw out a question, since this is sort of questions and improvisations. Um, what artist uh, generation are you? And this is something I think about, somebody was saying to me, you know, um, you're getting older, but your students always stay the same, and as long as you don't look in the mirror, you'll be fine. Because um, I always feel like, well, I'm the same age. The students are the same age, I'm the same age. But um, So there's different generations of artists. If you grew up, if you think about what you grew up with, if you grew up with a burnt stick and a cave wall, you were probably a Neanderthal artist. Um, if you grew up with a limestone, chalk, and stone tablet in your hand, you were probably a BC, not PC, but BC artist. A quill pen and a parchment, old world artist. Pencil and paper, that's me, old school artist. Mouse and Mac, you're soon going to be an old school artist. Um, the new school are the iPad and iPhone. And I'm thinking, what's it going to look like in the future? And probably Adobe is going to come up with a CS10 that you'll be able to implant into your cerebral cortex. And um, you'll be brilliant in school. Um, I, I, is Mario still here? Mario didn't show, I told him there'd be a photo of him. Uh, Mario Lara is an instructor here. He and I have known each other for 30 years. Um, we worked together, we went to school at San Diego State. Um, so just, you know, my students think I probably started out at 57, but actually I was 27 at one time. Um, and what really influenced a lot of my work was some very heavy building uh, processes. So there's a picture of Mario. We did this crazy project. I actually fell from this thing and almost killed myself. Um, and then we continued to do even more dangerous kinds of things. Um, so there's an element of risk that I've always taken in my work. Um, but I mean, literally, there was points in my life when I was young, much younger and much more stupid of uh, uh, doing things that were very, very risky. Um, working on very large uh, scale projects. This is a, uh, a building, uh, Tom Grandona's home. I don't know if any of you know him, but he's a local architect. We did these enormous uh, concrete cast uh, walls. Um, you can see with the figure there how, how large they are. One of the things that I've always been interested in is geom uh, both uh, sacred geometry and color. 
And um, color has meaning for different cultures. This is a wonderful uh, drawing by the architect Carlo Molino, and he was very into the occult meaning of color or hidden meanings of color. Um, and he would, when he did a color wheel, he would assign certain types of meanings to each color. Um, when he would do interiors, he would do interiors with this thought of these uh, colorful meanings. Um, if you're in interested in geometry, you know, we've, we've now reduced it to something where it's purely functional, but there was a time when geometry um, was a very spiritual kind of thing, and people did geometry, understood geometry um, and those geometric configurations to be much more meaningful than just their uh, past. Uh, I've spent probably 25 years. Um, my career was really known as a, as a furniture maker. This was uh, some work that I did uh, in about 1984. And every artist will have this moment where you do something, you draw it out, and it seems to have already existed and seems to be somewhat, and I hate to use the P word, but perfect. Um, and this was one of those projects where I just drew out a sketch, um, I built it, and uh, it, it did everything that um, I wanted it to do. These things uh, have the illusion that they're twisting and about ready to fall over. Um, <clears throat> They're made all out of one sheet of plywood, so all the cuts are arranged in such a way that there's no waste except for sawdust. Um, you can put these things together and they would, could create an absolute cube. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I did you know, several of these through probably late 80s. Um, about two years ago, there was a um, Pier 1 catalog that had one of these in it. <laughs> and I was like, what? Um, so that was kind of strange. Uh, this is just a you know installation shot. All the work was. This was an installation where um, I was living downtown. Uh, I had uh, <clears throat> worked on a uh, uh, what what was Java at the time. I think Doug Samay is here, who was the um, kind of brains behind that, brains and money behind that. <clears throat> and there was a gallery around the corner, the uh, Patty Ann Gallery, and she was doing some really fresh work. Um, she was showing an uh, artist from Los Angeles, Larry Pittman, who's now a very famous painter, was showing there, Roger Ehrman. Um, she had a schedule of artists. Um, she called me uh, and she said, an artist of mine canceled. Can you come up with a body of work in three weeks? And I said, of course I can. Um, so all this work was done in the course of about three weeks. This is jumping many, many years later. Um, and, you know, going to graduate school, refining the craft. Um, I mean, I've done literally hundreds of pieces of furniture. Um, this is one that kind of stands out for me. Um, I've always been involved with color and paint, um, and so this is taking that uh, heavily painted surface. These are kind of reminiscent of, of um, Frank Stella. Um, later I, I got into doing these pieces that were, um, uh, these are actually tables that hang on the wall. And it was, this commission actually started this. The, the people called me up and they wanted to look at a problem they had. They said, okay, here's the deal. We need a table that will seat 12 people. Um, we don't have room to store it and actually we don't even have room to keep it up. And so uh, through the discussions um, and after two bottles of wine in two hours, uh, the, the woman said, well, you know what? Um, I think we wasted your time. We're just going to get some folding car tables. And it just hit me like that. I said, oh, perfect. So <clears throat> what I did is made a series of four folding car tables. So when you walk into the room, you have no idea that they're tables. They just look like paintings. Um, but the bonus is that they, be, they can be reconfigured many, many times. So um, it's one of the things that's nice about furniture. It's an interactive type of art. Um, where you know you sit, you eat, you you know participate, but this enabled it. It took this to another level where the client then, once they have the piece, they really become part of the you know, the art expression. Um, there are multiple multiple expressions of this. Um, it's a factor of four, so four times four times four times four, however many that is. Um, you can come up, and, and I did a lot of work for these people, and every time I come over, the guy would come up and he goes, check out this one, you know, and he'd say, have you seen this? And I'm like, no. Um, so this, it's, it's, it's nice that, you know, you hand off a piece and then the, um, the client can then continue to work with it. Really, they be really become involved with the work. Um, I did several, of, this was the last one, which was one very large piece. It's 100, well, it's 12 feet long, and uh, 
each one is about 40 inches wide. So they hang on the wall. The, um, the things they hang on are, are pieces of work too. Uh, these are a little bit different. The legs unscrew from the table and then they go into the, uh, to the hanging pieces, uh, kind of sideways like pool cues, and then the table hangs up on them. Um, the people who bought this were, well, the, just to step back, I had, I had a show in Los Angeles in 2003, um, and these were in the gallery. And um, I don't mind talking a little bit about price. Students always go, how much did you sell your work for? And, and you go, well, this went for $7,000. And they're like, whoa! Except the gallery takes $3,500. Um, this, this was up like this. A, a woman came in and, and, and in the gallery. Uh, she said, how much is this? And I said, well, it's $7,000. And she said, wow, that is a huge painting for $7,000. And I said, yeah, and guess what? It's a table. And she said, I would never pay $7,000 for a table and walked away. So uh, this, was, this, was a, this was one of those ideas that, you know, you shoot yourself in the foot. You think, well, this is great marketing. So it, it, it kind of talks about this idea between art and craft, utility uh, and art, and this hierarchy that the market has kind of set and what people think is, you know, uh, high-level art and what is, you know, low-level art. So I thought it was an interesting kind of conundrum. It, conundrum. it didn't really work out that well for me financially. Um, but I still think it's an interesting uh, process. One of the things, so I made work up, up until about, or, or furniture work up until about 2004. And then um, this is the house my wife and I had been living in for 20 years. And it's, it, here it looks rather decrepit. It's a 1927 uh, bungalow style house on a canyon. We decided to jump in and do a very large remodel project. Um, so now this is on the back side. This has taken me, it's almost finished, it's taken about six years to work on this. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is that um, this building again came into my life very strongly and um, as I was working on this I didn't have the energy to do um, furniture. Um, I did build a kitchen, um, did, so this is all these hands did all of this. Um, it started from scratch. I built the cabinets in the studio, painted them. Uh, the concrete tops are, are, are cast concrete. I uh, did that in the living room before it was finished. So it's kind of start to finish, <clears throat> you know, my own project. So it's a very intimate sort of uh, kitchen. We, we'd been living in this space for 20 years and we thought about what would be the ideal kitchen. The footprint is not very big, but it's incredibly efficient. Uh, the corner drawers come out. Every single space has been uh, thought about in terms of uh, utility. This is the addition to the space. Um, so there's a partition here that's it's like a big super piece of furniture that separates the, the two. The television, which is on pivots in that, so you can watch it from the bedroom or the uh, living room. Um, you know, I, all of this stuff is, my friend Andy, I don't know if he's still here, helped me do this. Uh, this is the new bathroom cast concrete. Uh, we went to Home Depot and we were looking at countertop material and my wife saw um, Carrera marble. And she goes, wow, I really want Carrera marble. And I'm like, mm, okay. Um, so I, I sent it into Home Depot and they came back and their bid to do this was $4,000. And uh, <clears throat> I told my wife, I said, we are not spending $4,000. And she said, but it's my bathroom. You know, I said, look, I will make you marble crete and you will love it. And so that's what this is. It's two different colors of concrete that have been cast together and kind of swirled around and then polished. And um, it's, it's really incredibly unique. And uh, when she first looked at it, she said, it's not marble. And I said, yeah, but nobody has this. What's that worth? Uh, this is just a shot of it <clears throat> at night. Um, OK. So we'll look at some of the work. Um, it was interesting listening to um, uh, Michelle talk about her work and this idea of <clears throat> uh, looking and surveillance. Um, the, the piece that's in the gallery that's the five pieces, five views of building number two uh, was generated from two different ideas. One is I've always loved um, Hokusai's work and especially this series of the um, 36 views of Mount Fuji. And if you haven't seen this set of prints, you should look at them because Mount Fuji is always in these prints. And so what he went, he went around to different villages in Japan um, and did these uh, prints and studies, always seeing Mount Fuji. And I thought that was you know, sort of an interesting way to, to, to look at one object. Um, 
and then I thought about, um, you know, what is it that uh, we have now that is the most objective kind of separate points of view of one object? And it seems to me that these surveillance cameras are exactly that. Very objective. Um, there's no aesthetic input in this at all. So my idea was to try and come up with, you know, a, a building, a very simple building um, where you have these, um, it, it's like pure architecture. There's no aesthetics in it at all. Um, and so that's, that's how this came about, was this idea of, of coming up with a very simple building. Um, so the duct tape stuff started while I was working on the house. And the idea was I need something that would be quick and fast and creative. Um, I also at the time kind of discovered that there were multiple colors of, of duct tape. Um, so this was, I had done a, about a year's worth of work trying to figure it out because when I went on the internet and looked up duct tape art and how to do it, I couldn't find it. So um, I had to figure it out on my own, figure out what the substrate was, how to cut it. Um, so I struggled with that and this was the, I think the first successful piece. Um, and it's. Uh, very much uh, playing with uh, value, color, all those kinds of things, but still trying to come up with a very simple, uh, just, uh, you know, kind of archetypical sort of building and then uh, looking at the, you know, very, um, you know, uh, unsubjective or objective views. I, I have, I'm not a painter, um, I'm a builder, but I have looked at tons of art, I've looked at lots of painting. Um, the California hard edge painters are some people I'm interested in because we live in California. But one of the things that the California hard edge painters, especially Helen Lunderberg, was able to capture is the quality of light that we have here in Southern California. And that's something that's fascinated me for a very long time. Very simple painting, um, you know, very uh, simply done, but really captures the spirit and quality of light in Southern California. John McLaughlin is another um, very interesting uh, painter. He actually, to um, kind of keep his career going, he dealt in um, uh, Japanese woodblock prints, and that's and, and he lived in Long Beach. But he also worked on these very very simple compositions, um, and I, I just you know every time I look at these, I'm just floored with his. Um, sensitivity to just simple uh, proportion and exactly, you know, placing these things exactly and getting uh, the balance just right. This, this, this is one of those iconic uh, images when I first saw this, um, you know, I was probably, you know, 20 years old. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's certainly Southern California. David Hockney is a Southern California painter. Um, but this idea of the pool and how, you know, Southern Californians have bodies of water in their backyards, their own private body of water. Um, and and that's, that's sort of fascinated me that, okay, you have this place, you could go to the ocean, which is very close by, but it would be better to just own your own little piece of water that you can, you know, privately go in. It's, it seems rather absurd, especially, I guess it makes sense in one way we live in a desert, but in another, you know, water's really um, uh, uh, scarce. We are importing 90% of our water um, you know, from Colorado, the Colorado is driving, drying up, but, um, you know, we're keeping our, our pools full. Just inspirational architecture, modernist architecture. Um, this is, uh, if you're not familiar with Julius Schulman, he's a wonderful uh, uh, um, architectural photographer. So um, the work that's in the show certainly depends a lot on perspective, and um, this is you know, one of the most amazing uh, photographs I've, uh, I've seen that has perspective. This, this, you get the effect that, you know, it, it's going off in the distance. It's also a very romantic image, you know, this kind of romantic uh, 50s uh, setting. So, it start, it, after thinking about all that um, and starting to develop uh, the process, um, these pieces, they're, they're, they're actually drawn in a program called Google SketchUp, and if you haven't used it, it's a free download. Um, it's a pretty simple three-dimensional uh, modeling program. Um, these would be set up, uh, drawn out, laid out. Um, so the fun was really kind of setting up the, um, the model. Uh, laying them out really became, you know, like work. <coughs> um, so the, this, this is in the show. Um, I was interested in, in, in working with perspective, working with color, uh, and trying to get these images that become both illusional and then abstract. And this one, I think, did a pretty good job of doing this. Now, 
Uh, duct tape really comes, I mean, you think, wow, that's a lot of colors, but to a painter, 30 colors yes. is a really, if you told a painter, okay, here you got 30 colors, go for it, and you can't mix any of them, <coughs> um, they're going to go, you know, you're crazy. So you have to start thinking about how can I make these really work for me. Um, the transparency is an illusion based on the right juxtaposition of colors. So none of those colors are really transparent. Um, those of you that are in my class will be doing this two projects from now. <laughs> um, and the, you know, the interest in structure was also to start editing out information and uh, getting rid of some things like um, the, 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 the roof plane and the wall plane sort of meld together, but your eye doesn't really seem to care. Um, you know, I'm interested in how much we're willing to agree with in terms of uh, visual looking. I mean, we're pretty lazy in terms of looking at things. So artists can get away with a lot, if you know that. If you know that your viewers are relatively lazy, um, you, can, you can get away with a lot. So you can put a little bit of information and get a lot going on in there. Um, again, here's the pool. Um, <clears throat> You know, ready. You can jump out now. You may or may not have noticed this, and I tried to set up a a, a, a movie to do this, and it wouldn't do this. But this is the same building. We're just we're inside the building, looking out this time. So um, instead of seeing those nice little uh, Gene Davis paintings on the wall, now the wall has transformed itself into a painting. So, um, and this was again the same three-dimensional model, and I was just able to turn it in the modeling program. Um, what's great about the modeling program is I can set shadows on it and, and then begin to use them as, as compositions. Um, so again, you know, what does this have to do with unearned intimacies? And I, I asked Barbara and she said, well, you know, you're looking into somebody's home, there's nobody there. Um, but I think, I think something we talked about that's a little bit more important than that is that when you see photos of these work, you don't really get a sense of what's going on. When you see it in person, um, I think you get a, maybe a sense of the amount of craft and work that went into it, and hopefully you get a little bit intimate with my working process. So I think that would tie into it. Um, some more of that series. Uh, there was a whole series of these that are, um, everybody says they look like space capsules. Um, I've called these sitting ducks. There's a little story that goes with this, but I, I was thinking about you know all ducks lined up in a row and shooting them. Um, they're all about 24 by 24. They're really just color studies. You know, still trying to get familiar with uh, the color of the duct tape. Um, how does it work? How do you create volume? How do you make them glow? You know, how do you make this thing really look like it's got a light from within? Um, this is basically my palette. Um, it's not very broad. There's very few um, uh, uh, neutrals. Um, so the trick again is to, to make the viewer think that there's more colors than there, there really are. So this was, uh, this was an experiment in that. Um, the, the ones that I, I was just showing you are very planned out and drawn. This is something that's much more intuitive. This is actually what I'm more interested in, the fact that um, you just start working. You're not sure what's going to happen. This is more how a painter works. Um, you start laying your paint on, you're responding to it, you're moving back and forth. This takes a lot of, um, you know, I think I did uh, this side first, laid that out, and I go, okay, now how am I going to respond to that on the other side? Um, it takes a lot of cutting, laying down, looking back. You know, people say, how long do these things take? Um, I don't remember. I know they take a lot of time. They probably take more time. You know, I, I've probably done this one twice maybe three times until I get it right. But it's, you know, laying it down, taking it off, going back and forth. I'm getting better at it, but um, it, it, it takes a while. This one is called, so that one was called High Anxiety. This one was called um, Study of Recurring Anxieties. Um, I, was, I had a show at the uh, Cannon Gallery in, in uh, uh, Oceanside last summer, and uh, I had two weeks to get everything done, and I had to have a little minor foot, foot surgery. So, um, these are all done horizontal on a table, so there's a lot of walking around. So my foot was really in pain, and every time I walked, you know, I would see one of these. So this was this is really a you know kind of what I was seeing as I was working. So it's, it's a pretty good expression of the anxiety of am I going to get this done, and then you know the kind of pain going on that circulation of pain. Um, 
this is this is one when I started thinking about well, you know, this is tape. Am I really responding to the tapiness of this material? Um, so I thought, what is tape? Tape is just like little short sections. So again, this one started out, I think, here I didn't have a plan. Um, and, but my idea was to sort of modulate these um, kind of amorphous figures. The further back you get, the more realistic they are. And the closer you get, the more, you know, they, they get kind of fuzzy. Um, this one really kind of responds to digital imagery, you know, looking at pixels. Um, this is a twin one. I've done a whole series, they're called Seascapes. They're based on the letter C. I don't know if you see it, we'll see some other. I figure if you're in San Diego, you better be a pretty damn good seascape artist if you're gonna you know, get your stuff around. So I started this series of seascapes. Um, I showed this to my class the other day. This is a good example. This is made from four colors of duct tape. Um, the orange in the sea here and the orange at the top are exactly the same orange. Um, and you know people and the blues are exactly the same blue so it's just a matter of you know playing with the right juxtaposition and you start making it look like there's more colors than they are this is a, this is one that was recently completed um, the photograph doesn't really do justice to this it's a combination of a, a flat gaffers tape and then a shinier duct tape and what happens is as you walk around it this C will completely disappear, and then this one becomes more intense. Um, it's just, you know, visual tricks. Um, but doing these, and this is interesting about Michelle's stuff, I started doing these, I go, oh, they look like you're looking through blinds, right? So I started, you know, kind of playing around with that. This is a piece that, um, this is a study for a piece that I'm working on. Um, just a little plug, I'm going to have a show, a one-person show uh, in May at the Athenaeum La Jolla Museum, uh, the Athenaeum Music and Arts Library. Um, and I'm doing a piece, uh, it's a poem, it's called Painting is Dead. And uh, it, it goes through the poem, but what I did is I ran each line of the poem through a barcode generator. It's, it's the, the poem is embedded within this barcode. Um, the aesthetics are created completely by the computer. I'm just the laborer. I'm just like laying these things down. Um, what happens is kind of nice is occasionally they'll line up and those planes kind of shift. Um, so this is just a study for that. This is going back to those things that are a little bit more dimensional, but trying to you know play with um, uh, the illusion of both flat and perspective. This one's called green line, um, and <clears throat> if you look at that, it's one line that. that goes all the way around, but yet it still somehow gives us this illusion that it's a solid object. I hope you see it. I, um, some people see it, some people don't. What the photograph doesn't show that your, your retina will pick up, but the camera doesn't pick up, is that um, when you see it in person, the line down here is almost blue-green. By the time it gets to the top, it's yellow-green. And it, and it doesn't change. It's the same color. Just in terms of you know influences, this is a, a, a another piece that um, is one of those iconic pieces by Ron Davis. You know he's he's done a lot of uh, geometric stuff, and I love that. I saw this <clears throat> on a field trip um, to uh, the I think this is the one that the uh, L.A. County has, um, and I've always loved this the the, the figure. Uh, and uh, so I thought, well, I want to do one. So this is called Chrome Hinge. Um, just sort of an investigation of color and getting that illusion uh, working. It goes flat. Um, this is, uh, I love this. You know, um, it's basically that same figure. Uh, <clears throat> it's very Southern California. We get to contain our little body of water without a tremendous amount of input. We're not digging a hole, but we're still containing our water. Um, so this next body of work uh, that I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about doing is going to be you know, based on these figures. So uh, this is one that's sort of loosely based on that. Can you see the figure in this one? This one is a little bit more abstract, a little bit harder to see, um, but it goes back and forth. So uh, this illusion of transparency is just you know, made by you know, small pieces of tape together. Um, I showed this to Barbara, and she was like, nah, this doesn't have anything to do with uh, um, you know, under intimacy, so um, it's just another, you know, kind of figure study. <laughs> um, but it, when, when I heard about the show, 
uh, without seeing Michelle's work, the first thing I thought of was a peeping Tom. And I thought, wow, you know, I want to do a piece for the show that I really think. So um, I actually, this, I just went on the internet and found this. Is this one of yours, Michelle? No. no. Um, I just found, I said, oh, this is great. Um, I actually found this after I'd done these pieces. So these two pieces were done specifically for the show. Um, and, you know, they're rather abstract, but I think they resonate with Michelle's pieces sort of looking uh, through the window there. And that's it. Now I heard there were going to be 50 okay. questions. Questions? Okay. Yes. Um, I have a question. Did you ever have to get permission to show your lawyers? I have never had permission from anyone to take any of those photographs. And I have never, um, uh, and I, and, I, and I had no intention of it. Um, I have had some problems with showing the work in particular venues because people are worried about the fact that there could be some legal, uh, um, there's a very fine line as to what is legal and what isn't. So I, I really could say that at some point in time I, I, I could have trouble, but I've never shown them in a place where I thought that there would be a problem. Yes. So where did you find the duct tape? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> no. Uh, the, uh, uh, some of it I got at Walmart. Uh, some of it I got at Michael's. A lot of it I started buying on the internet. <clears throat> and then there was a, uh, a man here, I don't know if you saw him, he came late, uh, David Gladish. He's a representative for Braun Tapes, which is like the biggest West Coast distributor of tape. Um, he saw my work on the website. He called me up. He said, I want to come over and see your work. I'm very interested in it. And by the way, can I bring you some tape? And I said, yeah. He came with this big box of really high-end tape, the tape I wouldn't spend money buying because it was 25 bucks a roll. Um, and so we started talking, and he goes, yeah, if you need any more tape, just come on over. I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. So I went over to, to their distributorship. They have, I mean, this is all samples that they're given by vendors, right? Wall of tape. And I'm, I'm like, okay, give me a box. And um, You taped your shirt. Yeah, I t everything. <laughs> um, and then <clears throat> I was talking about the difficulty of, like, cutting all this stuff. And he says, well, you know, we can cut this stuff for you. Okay, I need so many rolls in one inch, so many rolls in half inch, so many rolls in quarter inch. And he goes, no problem. So it's kind of like having a sponsor. It's great. I'm telling you, I'm not a very fortunate guy, but that was like somebody was like. So that's I, so uh, there are multiple sources. Yeah, one of the things that you that you can do with color is as long as the values work to create plastic space, you can use color however you want. Your eye will agree with that. So colors that you wouldn't think would go together, but you use your yellows for your lightest values, you use, use your blues for your darkest values. So when, once you understand that and you start working with that, you can build any kind of you know, space. And your eye is like, I mean, an interior designer would go and go, oh my god, those colors don't work together. But your eye agrees with them in terms of the plasticity of the space. Michelle, do you yes. still sh every time uh, shoot at night at all? Like uh, go out at night still and shoot some surveillance? And would, would you ever think about shooting it during the day? Um, yes, I still do. I, um, you know, I, and, I, and when I'm driving around, I see certain homes that I, I feel will work. And so I keep those in my mind and I, I kind of target, you know, homes. And then I'll, <laughs> well, <laughs> guys. <laughs> and uh, will I do it at day? Um, I'm not really drawn to the daylight and take in, in, in um, shooting. I mean, as a photographer, the night light that is that comes through a lit home is so beautiful to me in many in many ways. So I'm really drawn to the night in, in, visually, and also 
the sneaking around is easier at night. <laughs> um, if you, you know, when I'm sitting there and people walk by, you know, I kind of, you know, kind of get low and, and in the daytime it would be much more difficult to get done what I do. I mean, I have been chased by police and, you know, different people, so I think in the daytime I might have a little bit more difficulty. I don't even think about the day doing it. It doesn't, I'm not attracted to it in some way, in any way, but I could think about it. I photograph people who are bandaged and hurt. Do you think that's an invasion of their privacy? I, I ask them, but I'm still, I'm photographing an intimate, um, something intimate in, in their lives. So, I mean, I don't feel that what I'm doing is anything other than looking like you do. I look, I take a walk, I look, I drive, I look at your home, I look at, I look at your dog, I look at your mother, and when I decide to take a photograph, when I decide to hit the shutter is when I decide to hit the shutter, and it doesn't, I'm not, I'm not doing anything but halting a moment. That's all I'm doing is I'm taking one image, <coughs> one second at a time. All I'm merely doing is observing and shooting. And I was, like I said, how I began was that I was interested in how people do go into people's private lives. And, and, but, but actually, private detectives have a motive. They either are, you know, checking out crime or investigating insurance or whatever. I had nothing. I had no motive except that I wanted to see what people were going to, were, were going to show me, what it was I was going to go out there and was going to be revealed to me. I also have intentionally put in images that you can recognize people and ones that you can't because I feel they both, you know, I, I, I'm kind of accepting of both, of all of it. And so um, I think sometimes the face is important. I think sometimes the rec being, knowing that there's really a, a, a face behind that plate made that a much stronger and more powerful image than had you not seen her face. So I'm making these decisions as I'm watching. I, I think about how I make my work, and I'm not going to be so, ex you know, vulnerable to be able for someone just to easily come and um, sue me without a big fight. I, t I am never on their property. I am never in someone's pro private space. So not being in your private space does not allow you to really um, uh, to really come after me for, for be, being on your private property. Also, wait, may I finish? Let me just finish one thing. Um, also, I never show people in a bad light. Now, if I were to start to show people in a bad light, and I made a story about the woman, uh, 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 any, any one of those people, if I started and I made a story, um, and I started to say that, you know, drug dealing and drug dealers look like this or, or gave him some, put him in a, in a bad light and made, made them look and sound like they were doing something that was wrong, then you could come after me. But you can't come after me for taking your photograph. You, 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 can't, you can't come and be, unless I put you in a bad light. Unless I tell you, unless I say something about you that is negative, something about you that isn't true. Something, of, unless I make the story about you wrong. I don't have favorite colors, only favorite color relationships. So what is it? Oh, it depends on the day, but I like pink and yellow. And did you do a lot of cutting since you, with the duct tape at all? Because you said you ordered it at certain... Oh, yeah, it's all, it's all got to be cut. Yeah, there's no getting around that. And do you still make furniture? Um, <clears throat> I'm making some furniture-ish pieces for this exhibition in, in May, and um, I would say that building that house was like building a big piece of furniture. <laughs> and you're going to sit in it for a long time. For a long time, <laughs> yep. Just refinanced it for 30 years. Let's see, I'm 57. <laughs> You'll probably so, refinance it again before yeah. you're 30 years. <laughs> I don't think rates are going to get any lower. So. Sure, thank you. First of all, house. I love your the work you've done on that. I'm a big Candy House fan. But Michelle, um, it's very clear you've touched on a really sensitive nerve in society. And I just one short comment before my question to you. 
is that we really have, through the media, become a world of surveillance and, and uh, kind of intrusion, but it's invited by people through, one example is Facebook. You can set your profile to public or private, and that's an option, but many people don't realize that so much information on you and your picture and your, you know, your life and your story is all out there, and anyone that really wants to can find it, and so I just think that's an interesting thing that people sometimes overlook is that you know, we're putting that information out there every day, and we're not making a big deal of it. Maybe we should be. I, I don't know. I haven't really thought that out yet. But um, I just wanted to know what you felt when performing your voyeurism or whatever, because I'm a big night walker, too. I love to walk my dogs at night, and it's amazing because it's better than TV, because people just leave their windows open, and they're, you know, like, you can hear what they're doing, and I'm not trying to go looking at them, but by walking down the sidewalk, and that's the only light on the block, it's impossible not to see, and so I just wanted to know if you put more importance on the connection you feel like you make with people when you're watching them, or is being disconnected from them important in what you do? Like, do you feel it's important for you to, to be connected or feel intimate with them and seeing that moment in their lives, or is the disconnect and the, the part of you being kind of an outside observer more important? I just wanted to see what you felt about that. I think being disconnected from them is important because I like that I get to pick and choose and I have no real connection until I sit there and then when I sit and wait and watch I kind of form a connection it's like all of a sudden then I start to really um, decide I'm making I'm making I'm taking that decisive moment I'm deciding so at this point in time when I decide that this is who I'm going to shoot I definitely feel a connection between that person yeah. It, it changes, yeah. It switches, and it's yeah, and it's and it can be, you know. And I and I think about it. I mean, I don't just go and shoot. I'm thinking. I'm standing. I'm sitting. I'm watching. I move. I stay. I sit at a place for a while, and then I say, no, this isn't right, you know. And I move on. And then and like I said, I've got a few places in my head that I I drive by, and I drive by them all the time, and I watch that house, and I see, and I just think about. This is, this is interesting to me, what they're doing in there, who, how many people, what's on the walls, what they're exposing to every night. There's this place I drive by on the way to the freeway all the time, and I'm like, this guy, I, he's just begging for it. I'm like, you know, he's got this incredible huge window, and it's open, and he's always doing all sorts of things out there. And I'm like, you know, uh, you know, so I do feel connected in some way, but I mean, I think I make the connection. You know, the funny thing is that I don't like Facebook. I don't like, I don't... I'm just such a private person. So for me, for, you know, for me to have taken this on has really made some changes in the way that I really, I operate. It's like, okay, I can do this. I am allowed to do this. Because really I was taught this is not what I'm supposed to do. How you went about getting these photographs, and that's what I want to ask you. Because you've said you're a private person. And, you know, I bet you had this, even before the first time you did this, probably had this idea like rolling around through your mind. What was the, what was your muse that made you jump over that first huddle to go out there and do this? Like what, how long did you like let this just marinate in your head and then like finally strap your camera in your car and just like do it? I thought about it for a long time. And, yeah. that, and that's kind of how my process is. I think about projects because I work in series a lot. So I think about a series for a long time and then I think about, okay, I just gotta jump in and it's funny. Uh, in my work, most a lot of my work is based is fear based. A lot of the things that I do is about I'm a, I am fearful of, of going out and take those pictures. Just like the series where I take photographs of people who are bandaged, I'm about I mean I can't look at I mean I go to the hospital and I faint. I mean no matter what it is. I mean I thought about it for so long that I wanted to photograph. I think about the bandages as a as a, um, a metaphor and why it is how how we wear our pain in society and whatever. The first time I went to take those photographs, I stood at, at um, Huntington Hospital, in front of Huntington Hospital, and I had my, four, I had a, my camera on a tripod, I was shooting on um, two and a quarter. And so I had everything set up. I couldn't talk to anybody. I couldn't get, I couldn't get a person. It's, it's, it's something about like, it's, it's like there's some bit of fear in all my work. It's something that makes me, it's I have to go and do it. I'm afraid to do it. It's something I wanna shoot but it's something that's maybe private, something that's maybe not part of my business, maybe something 
that it, I have no, you know, may, uh, maybe I shouldn't be there, but for some reason I need, to, I need to be taking these images. I think I'm exposing our vulnerability. Yes, I, I, I definitely think that the photographs talk about that, speak to that. Um, and I also think that people do, I mean, there's a lot of things that people do as I'm walking down the street. I don't even want to see them doing that, but they show it me what, you know, I mean, half the people walk around with their pants halfway down their butt. I'm really not interested in seeing their butt, but you know what? They make me look at them every day because I've got to walk behind them. So it is something that we're, you know, I think we do this. I think we expose ourselves. I think we, we have people look at, at, at things that maybe people don't want to look at. I mean, I don't want to look at a lot of things I see. I'm not particularly interested about seeing people crawl all over one another and you know, molesting each other on, on the street sometimes, you know, the way some people are, but they do it, and it's like, you've got to walk by them, you've got to walk around the, you know, if you if they're at the corner, you've got to get through the corner, there's people, you know, at, you know, people shouting at you, at, you know, people acting crazy, and I don't want to see that, but I have to see it. I started to really started to feel like people were watching me. And, and the more that I did it, the more I felt like people were watching me. Like I said, I think people watch me when I'm in the car, and then I think they follow me home, and then I think they're watching me in my house. I get real, it goes, yes, it goes very deep. It isn't like, uh, you know, I don't just do this like, ah, uh -huh, here's a photograph of somebody in their, uh, you know, I don't know, in their underwear or, you know, whatever. And, that, and I'm not looking for certain, I'm not looking for you in your underwear or you, you know, in, you know, some compromising situation. I'm looking at the intimacies in which we expose to people every day and night. And people are doing it at night and they're doing they're exposing yourself to me all the time and everybody else. And I'm just merely halting that for one moment and getting it back. Because I don't do it. I just shoot it. I feel like I'm vulnerable. I feel like I put myself in a vulnerable place. Not only that they're vulnerable, but I'm vulnerable. I'm doing something that I think like you back there sir you think it's a bad, it's, a, it's kind of a, uh, you know, uh, it's a violation. I think it's a violation in some ways, but in other ways it isn't because. It wasn't that it would have made, it, it's sort of like the high of the process. <laughs> yeah. And so earlier you said that you couldn't stop if you wanted to. You made right. that point during your, your uh -huh. presentation. And so do you think your art has become an excuse for this sort of obsession that you have with, it's gotta be a rush, it's sort of probably, a, it's like getting drugs, I mean, I. <laughs> it's like a ritual, you know, you gotta make the phone, you go down, you go to this place, and it's just like this process, but the picture is neat, but it's the whole thing in between that's like, get your heart racing. Okay, I, I, I have a really good answer for this. I am obsessed, you're right, I'm very obsessed, but I'm obsessed with making art. That's what I'm obsessed with, and I don't know, and I don't feel like I'm obsessed with making this particular series of images, because I don't have to, like I don't Jones, I don't sit home at night and go, come on, let's hurry up and finish eating, because I've got to go out and make these pictures. It's, it's not that kind of a thing at all, it's just, it's 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 a body of work that I'm drawn to, and that I I will complete the you know it'll end the day I decide the day it's completed, and I don't know when that will ever when that will be. But it's I don't think I'm obsessed to be a voyeur. I think I'm obsessed about every body of work that I make, and that is no different than if I were to make a you know if I shot um, a still life. I would do it every day or every other day or whenever I needed to do it. So I'm obsessed to make art. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> my mother was uh, a painter, and uh, I remember, I wish I had this piece, uh, I was about six years old, I got, and she was also a Sunday school teacher, um, I got into her paints, and I painted, I remember it was very dark, black and red, and it was like half of a devil's face coming out, <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and I showed it to her, and she just freaked out, so I didn't, I didn't paint for a while after that. <laughs> So maybe I was a painter first, <laughs> sidetracked by building. But um, I really don't consider myself a painter. I'm a builder. So all, I, that's why those things are called buildings. They're all built. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you.